Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cameron Gleeson. I'm Senior Investment Strategist here at BetaShares. Um, I'm delighted to, to introduce Louis Crew, our, our Chief Investment Officer. We're going to have a bit of a Q&A session today just to provide a, an update on what's happened in terms of the, the scene for, for foreign banks, particularly those in the US and Europe, um, and what this means for Australian hybrid holders. Uh, before we sort of start, obviously everything we say here is general in nature and please seek your own advice. Um, we're, uh, we're joined by Louie now. Unfortunately, um, I, I'm sitting in a hotel room in Newcastle. We're meeting some advisors up here in Newcastle, New South Wales today. And uh, due to the dependency on the Wi-Fi uh, network here, we decided it was better to go with cameras off. But hopefully what we've got to say is, uh, is more useful than what we look like. But if you need a, a visual reference, there we are. Um, Louis, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Ken. Okay, so before we start, um, we're using GoToWebinars to conduct the Q and A today. Please uh, have a have a look at the, the panel there. Please enter any questions that you've got, um, and we'll endeavour to get to as many as possible. We've got some pre-prepared questions because there's been obviously issues that we've been talking about with the investors throughout the week, and we'll send you a recording of this session afterwards. But fire your questions questions in as we go, and we'll, we'll endeavour to get to to all of them. I hope. Um, what's happened in terms of international banks over the last couple of weeks? Banking's are a critical part of the functioning of a market-based economy. Um, before I get Louis to comment on the, the events, um, I think it's important to really have a look at what a bank does, um, you know, how we rely on banks, how, how they function. Um, you know, just you know, broad, broadly speaking, if I think about myself as a saver, um, you know, I, I'm not likely to go out and, and lend money to someone who wants a 30-year mortgage with my with my um, everyday savings account. Like, I'm potentially going to need that money before the next 30 years, and and I, and I'm also probably going to be too risk averse to lend my money to a small business um, because I might lose some of that money. Um, and, and so, you know, banks perform a really important role in in our in our economies in terms of you know pooling pooling funding or pooling deposits and savings and you know, really efficiently allocating capital to those that need credit, that need capital in our economy. Um, I show here a, a bank balance sheet um, and banks aren't, you know, they're a little bit more complicated than just collecting deposits and issuing loans. They're dealing with two key risks. One is solvency risk and the second one is liquidity risk. So in order to ensure that they can meet those particular or properly address those risks, they collect funding from a number of different sources. And I show there, for example, deposits, they issue bonds of different tenors, they issue hybrids, and they will also raise shareholder capital or ordinary shareholder capital. They use those proceeds, of course, to offer loans um, to customers, um, but they will also hold other assets, so, such as interest bearing trading assets, um, e even their own um, you know, branch network where, they, where they're in the physical stores. Now, you know, as I said, the two issues of solvency risk and, and liquidity risk, that's what a bank manager or a bank treasury department is trying to manage, is trying to pull these risks and ensure that they're adequately capitalised such that deposit holders in particular get their money back. Um, Louis, I might invite you in there. Um, so, you know, with this particular, you know, particular event, can you just sort of talk to us about how this crisis started in the US, how it moved to Europe, um, what's happened so far? Yeah, thanks, Cam, and good afternoon, everyone. In order to answer the question, we do need to look at the facts of these events. So apologies if you're already familiar with the detail, but it, it is very important to establish what has happened and almost equally important what didn't happen in order to draw some wider conclusions. So it all started with Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, on 8 March, and uh, its failure was a result of three forces that combined, that being macro events, the makeup of the balance sheet, and then the profile of the deposit base. From a macro perspective, we've come from a period of almost zero interest rates to one where the Fed is now, you know, hiked by 475 basis points in a very short period of time. And due to a lack of lending opportunity, certain banks and SVB was one of those. They invested a lot of their deposits into longer dated government bonds and agency mortgage backed securities, you know, when the cash rates were at zero. The longer dated securities is where they could earn some additional interest from term premium perspective. And rather than receive those zero rates at the short end. Now, given the substantial increases in rates, those higher duration securities were sitting with decent unrealized losses, which did not have to go through their PL due to the classification as, as held to maturity. 
Also relevant is that the deposit base was mainly tech and VC companies um, who in themselves were having a bit of a tough time. So their cash flow needs meant that they started withdrawing their deposits. And these unrealized losses then became realized losses as the banks had to sell their assets to fund the withdrawals. And the markets took notice of these losses and that became a very visible solvency issue. And as mentioned, the bank had a concentrated client base being tech companies. So in other words, no real retail deposit footprint. And after losing confidence in the bank's financial position, they withdrew large amounts of money in a very short space of time. So this then became a liquidity issue on top of a solvency issue, which was Cam was referring to as well. Now, to the extent that other banks had similar profiles and more reliant on deposits, they soon fell under the spotlight and depositors you know, became nervous again, uh, very much in a very short space of time. And so Signature Bank failed and currently First Republic Bank is facing considerable challenges in restoring confidence and liquidity. It's also interesting that these failures had nothing to do with the more traditional reasons such as bad loans or collateral, or even the funding stress in the wholesale market. So within the US, this clearly impacted some regional banks, given this similar profile. The larger US banks are generally not affected to the same extent, and there's no real concern over that part of the US banking system at present, especially since the broader economy and the average consumer is still in pretty good shape as well. That is also largely reflected in the equities market where you've seen the US banks, you know, they sold off, but not as much, the larger ones sold, but not as much as the regional. So the KBW index, which is the regional bank index, you know, lost over 20% in three days after SVB's collapse, where someone like JP Morgan was down less than 5%. Now, how did all of this affect Credit Suisse, you might ask? Well, although confined to the US regional bank market, both investors and depositors became increasingly nervous about where else there could be problems. You know, after all, banking, you know, simply put, is really dependent on confidence. And Credit Suisse has had some incidents of scandals and write downs and, and you know, question marks over their turnaround strategy. But it wasn't particularly in the spotlight until a combination of an announcement of accounting irregularities and the announcement by their largest investor, the Saudi National Bank, that they would not support another equity raising. In fairness, that comment was not the best wording ever used since they most likely meant for regulatory purposes. They didn't want to go over 10%, but the market interpreted otherwise. Now, one has to remember that SVB itself finally collapsed when it tried to do an emergency equity raising, which failed. And so Credit Suisse depositors and investors got really spooked and dumped shares and you know, withdrew a large amount of funds. And not even the Swiss National Bank's 50 billion Swiss franc loan facility could stop the run on the bank within two days. Um, and the SMB had to orchestrate that buyout with UBS. So the fact is that the US regional bank experience really had nothing to do with Credit Suisse. In fact, Credit Suisse was, was well capitalized compared to peers, so no solvency or liquidity concerns. But it all came down to very nervous market and client panic, and, and it happened over a very short space of time. So really a classic bank run, if you like. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting that, right? You're absolutely right. That crisis of confidence, I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, Credit Suisse has sort of gone through a period of about two years of, of various issues, controversies, um, whether it be Green Seal uh, or the Archegos uh, hedge fund losses they experienced there, and um, and obviously a earnings loss announced with accounting irregularities. So it was almost the market just sort of seeking out the next the next weakest bank, um, and unfortunately they they came came unstuck. And once you lose confidence and you have that bank run, it almost becomes self fulfilling there, doesn't it? But um. I guess the next question from that is, do, do we have a global banking crisis now? And, and, and how does this compare to the GFC you know, as, as a benchmark? Yeah, question, Cam. The, the events that unfolded are very different to what occurred during the GFC, where there was a broader catalyst in falling house prices, and it was also rapid in the funding contagion. Of course, there are no guarantees that other areas of stress can't emerge from this point onwards, but based on the current challenges, uh, they are only exposing banks with particular deposit concentration and significant long duration assets that were gathered during low interest rate periods. I'd also say that another important aspect when compared to the GFC, you know, banks are much better capitalized post GFC given the stricter regulatory capital environments and, and requirements they have to, to hold. And therefore, broadly speaking, they're much better placed to deal with these, these market challenges. And then encouragingly, a very quick intervention by the US regulator who protected all depositors when, you know, even though those balances exceeded the maximum $250,000 uh, uh, that is insured. And the Swiss regulator, you know, who orchestrated uh, that takeover of a global systemically important bank, you know, did a lot to calm the market. And there's, there's been no cross contagion to other financial intermediaries to date. 
So this was different during the GFC and that you know, intervention took some time, meaning the funding market basically dried up, which ultimately impacted the real economy as well. But you know, this time around, they acted swiftly. Great. So, so I mean, yeah, what, what does this really mean for the banking industry in the US and Europe? What, what, what do you expect to see changes there? I think firstly, um, it will impact you know, all the bank's cost of capital, both debt and equity. So, you know, that speaks to, to you know, profitability going forward. Secondly, uh, we're likely to see further consolidation as smaller banks are either taken over or their clients actually move to bigger and more safer banks. Um, and then thirdly, I'd also argue we'll start seeing some tighter capital requirements and oversight outside the largest banks. There's still a bit of a blind spot in the US regulatory framework for those banks under $250 billion where uh, there is a lower level of oversight and I'm sure one of the outcomes post, uh, on this post-mortem will be to, to address some of this oversight and the capital treatment for, for those smaller banks. Yeah, so, so, so not great for, for equity holders of those banks and obviously some depositors have had some nervous nights there where they thought they, their cash was safe. Um, but I guess thinking about this from the context of, of Australian investors and Australian banks, uh, and, and you know, we, we all hold our, our deposits and mortgages with Australian banks. Um, can, can what's happened overseas, can that also, you know, be brought home here? Can we see that happen in Australia? How safe are our banks here? Well, I think as it relates to Australian banks in general, it's a very different story to what I shared with you uh, to date. So, so a couple of things. Firstly, if you have a look at you know this chart, and I think we've got a chart we're going to share. Um, Australia's big four banks are some of the most well-capitalized banks in the world with common equity tier one or CET1 ratios in the high teens on a Basel equivalent basis. You know, APRA requires a, a higher ratio compared to minimum standards globally. And Aussie banks are also subject to much stricter liquidity rules than their US and European counterparts. And they're also only allowed to hold government bonds for their high quality liquid assets. Um, you know, rather than, for example, the bank issued covered bonds or residential mortgage-backed securities that uh, US and European banks can hold. And secondly, uh, Australian major banks have superior credit ratings compared to global peers, you know, being double A minus per S&P. By comparison, like US is, the US's largest bank, JP Morgan, is only a single A minus, um, you know, for comparative purposes. And then thirdly, the deposit base is more retail in nature, and so a lot more diversified. And the importance of this in the current environment cannot be overstated. And then lastly, uh, they run a more traditional retail banking business, so they don't have very large investment banking units, and the asset side of the business is therefore much simpler. That it's mainly floating rate mortgages and some some corporate lending. The other trade tradable instruments only make up you know about five percent of their of their total. So overall, I would say the reasons for the banks failing overseas do not currently apply to the larger banks in Australia. I think that this global experience will once again highlight how strong our major banks are. Um, and you know, one can even see it during the most recent you know, relative share price performance, where you know they've fallen, you know, by way less than you know the US or European counterparts. Cam, you still with us? Sorry, Lou, I'd, I'd gone on mute, so I wasn't adding any background noise. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I think what you said is, you know, is it fair. It's also interesting to note that Bendigo Adelaide Bank and Bank of Queensland, the Australian regional banks, haven't faced um, the same issues that we've seen for those US regional banks. Um, you know, to, speaks to the uh, the banking model in Australia and and the, uh, the you know APRA our regulator, their requirements around capital and liquidity. Um, so, I mean, moving on to, you know, talk um, more specifically about hybrid securities, which, you know, globally, um, you know, are generally called additional tier one capital securities, but here we call them hybrid securities. Um, you know, one of the, the, you know, talked about aspects of, of that Credit Suisse buyout by, by UBS was the fact that their um, AT1 capital securities were completely written down or bailed in. Um, and, and that what sort of surprised a lot of commentators and investors was that the the shareholders, you, if you if you had twenty tw about twenty three um, Credit Suisse shares, you ended up with one UBS share. So the equity holders in Credit Suisse still received some residual value, while these hybrid holders got got burnt. 
um, which is, you know, flies counter to, and I think we can go back to the diagram here, a commonly held understanding as to the capital structure and the priority of hybrid holders versus common equity holders. Um, you know, so, so, you know, you know, given that, should investors be concerned that the same treatment could be imposed on their bank hybrid securities in Australia? Well, yes, the fact that Credit Suisse's uh, AT1 securities were permanently written down at full whilst shareholders received some residual value did shock the market. I mean, the write down was enforced by the Swiss regulator FINMA. And according to the terms and conditions of these instruments, there was a provision that requires their full write off upon the occurrence of a viability event, which occurs when Credit Suisse Group receives an, an irrevocable commitment of extraordinary support from the public sector. Now, whilst this cause ripples through the market, the, the fact is that the terms of these securities were clear and again reinforces that one has to do one's homework and understanding all the detail when it comes to hybrid issuances. The AT1 market did sell off heavily in, in Europe on Monday due to those broader concerns about the credit hierarchy of AT1 securities. But then there were some reassuring comments by the regulators in the EU and the UK and, and even Canada for the matter after they confirmed that common equity instruments are the first to absorb losses. and only after their full use would AT1 be required to be written down. So this definitely helped to calm the market and, and prices did recover meaningfully post those comments. So now should investors be concerned more broadly? Um, the fact is that upon close inspection, the terms as applied to the CS hybrids are very specific to Swiss banks with, with UBS being the only other bank that has similar wording in the issuance. So these terms are not seen more broadly in other issuances. As it relates to Australian major bank hybrids, well, actually, let me first just point out that we have seen bailing provisions and missed dividends in Europe before. So a loss is not a first time event there. Whereas in Australia, we've never experienced a bailing um, ever. So the, the event of a bank failure requiring a government bailout, you know, Aussie bank hybrids do convert into ordinary equity rather than being written off. This conversion can be partial or full, depending on how, how fresh the equity capital the bank needs, uh, which means that APRA may not need to fully convert all the hybrids into bank equity. So from that perspective, there also shouldn't be any concern that a similar treatment to the CS hybrids will be applied here to Australian banks. Thanks, Louis. So yeah, I, I think that's it is an interesting point. If you look back over history, um, the performance of hybrids and um, the um, the, the history of Australian uh, banks or ADIs calling it first available call date, um, consistently paying distributions, that's what we've seen in Australia. It hasn't necessarily applied in Europe. So you would suggest, and even the credit ratings of the hybrid instruments here versus Europe uh, of the big four banks are, are high, more highly rated, um, shows that this is not the first time that, that Australian hybrids have, have stood up uh, versus the overseas counterparts. Um, so I've also got like this little chart here, and. It, Got, this is a basic timeline of a typical hybrid security. I think it's, it's worth recapping the mechanics, the terms of an APRA regulated hybrid issued by an Australian bank. Um, and look, I've only got time to go through this and give you an incomplete picture as to how they work. Hybrid uh, prospectuses, uh, they're about 100 pages long. You, you, can, you can find further detail and read all risks in those. But broadly speaking, hybrids pay your distribution generally quarterly. Um, you'll generally get your, your investment back in cash or an equivalent value of shares on an optional call date or mandatory exchange date if all goes well and subject to some specific conditions. Now, I don't want to understate risks. Like there, there are um, risks to receiving distributions and there are risks to the return of your capital being extended, um, but there are also provisions that provide you some degree of protection. The, the, the risk that you really care about, the, the most prevalent risk with, with any hybrid Australia or in Switzerland is the risk of, of loss of capital. So that's the key risk, that, that capital risk. Now today's hybrids, they were designed by regulators after the GFC and they were designed to form another layer of, of loss absorbing capital if we have another one of those GFC you know, banking crises. And the, that risk to losing your capital it is based on a very large downside event. So if we talk about that risk of a bank getting into trouble and in Australia, it's capital ratio falling below 5.125%, that's called a capital trigger event. We can also have the risk of APRA unilaterally declaring a non-viability trigger event. Uh, they're the two events that can relate to a to, to an equity conversion outside of the mandatory conversion. 
Now, the risk of losing your capital depends on the ordinary share of that bank having fallen by more than 80% from the time the hybrid was issued. So to make that very clear, if when I bought a hybrid over a bank, a big four bank, if the share price of the ordinary shares of that bank were $100 a time of issue, if the conversion happens at the time when the share price had fallen from $100 to $25, I'll still receive back my full $100 worth in shares. It's when that share price falls by more than 80%, I start to lose some of my capital. So this, it is an extreme downside event, um, but you know it is obviously worth considering. It's, it's very complicated to try and judge um, you know, the likelihood of that occurring or the risk around a hybrid, which is a very good reason for considering an actively managed approach to hybrid securities. Um, and of course, we have HBRD, um, which called our capital managed, actively managed Australian hybrids ETF. Um, so that, that's just so to recap in terms of the background and, and where, we, where you see risk um, to an Australian regulated hybrid. Um, really, back, back to you. So how, how have these events impacted markets for hybrids, um, both you know, in Europe, uh, US and, and Australia? Yeah, on Monday, the European hybrid market was down. So obviously Credit Suisse uh, UBS transaction happened over the weekend. So on the Monday when it opened up, uh, the European hybrid market was down intraday about 15%, which is quite a lot. But um, as I mentioned, after the updates by the EU and the UK regulators, um, it did, you know, it ended up down only about five percent. So it really, their comments did a lot to to help stabilise uh, those markets, and they did they did recover, so, you know, quite a bit. On the ASX, where you know most of the Australian bank hybrids actually trade as listed instruments, the market was a lot calmer and only down about one point two percent, you know, on Monday, as uh, you know, as seen in terms of the performance of our two Australian hybrid funds, so that's HBRD and Beehive. In fact, after yesterday's trading, the overall move is, is actually less than 1%, um, you know, since, since Monday. So considering all that happened, it's not a particularly large move. You know, for example, during COVID, we saw multiple days down more than 2%, uh, with a total drawdown of about 15%. So um, it doesn't surprise me too much. I think it confirms, again, that most Australian investors realise how well the Australian banks are capitalised and that they are not exposed to the current challenges experienced in the US or Europe. Uh, and just for confirmation, like HBRD and BRI, they don't hold any European uh, bank hybrid exposures. Um, another important factor just to mention is that the Australian major bank hybrids are actually investment grade as well, which, you know, compared to their inferior rated overseas counterparts. So it's, um, it's worthwhile remembering this as well. Yeah, so great, great, Louis. So, so what about, um, there's a question coming here, just about the the three year um, term funding facility, which which um, was was put in place in the height of COVID, coming to an end, and that was obviously a cheap source of funding for, for banks. Do you expect the end of the the three year term funding facility may increase spreads on T two and, and hybrids? Um, and second part of that question: How much allocation can HBRD allocate to T two bonds? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the replacement for TFF. I think will most likely come from senior issuances. And so tier two may see some associated issuance uh, along with that. So maybe some price impact there. However, it does appear that most of the majors have already started pre-funding for the TFF maturity. And so they've done that via senior issuances already. So um, that is what we've seen. So as it relates to how much HBRD can allocate to tier two, um, HBRD is quite unique in that it can roam the capital structure, so it can actually be fully invested in tier two or, or even senior bonds for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And then um, what about, um, what are the ramifications for HBRD again, talking about that ETF? Um, and is the current price weakness structural, um, you know, a permanent change in, in hybrid risk? Um, or how much is, is effectively, you know, short-term sentiment? I think you've sort of covered this in, in our discussion, but we're worth recapping. Yeah, so firstly, as I mentioned, I don't think the price weakness has been all that material in, in Australia following the events in Europe. Therefore, I don't think it's structural and I think it more broadly reflects a tightening in financial conditions. And this is actually impacted across the capital structure, you know, where we've seen credit spreads widening. So it's not a it's not a hybrid thing uh, in isolation. So that's that's my main observation there. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and look, th th there is a question about whether or not um, this is, you know, the Credit Suisse events with their AT1s um, allowing shareholders to get compensation first has created any sort of precedent. Look, I think I think you sort of address this. I guess my, one key point to really hammer home there is that their hybrids didn't have the ability for an equity conversion. Um, they they simply had the choice of of write off or or not. Um, and, and certainly that, that feature alone is, is, a, is a positive for Australian hybrids, the fact that the equity conversion is sort of your, um, your priority in terms of, um, uh, you know, a capital event. Um, and there, there is obviously, you know, questions around, has this meant that there's been a repricing of premiums on, on debt instruments? As Louis talked to, not in Australia in terms of market pricing and hybrids. Um, we'll see what happens next time UBS needs to issue um, hybrids in the Swiss regulatory regime. Um, but, but certainly, you know, things have calmed down here in Australia. Um, what about this question here? So we've got, um, really there's been a question over a period of time as to whether this aggressive rate hiking cycle was gonna break something, um, was, was the term that people sort of use. And the question is, um, you know, whether or not, you know, is, is this a sign that, that the Fed's hiking cycle has finally broken something? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, there have been periods before where they've had major rate hiking uh, cycles and, and events that have unfolded. Um, it is challenging for banks. I mean, banks you know, tend to lend long, borrow short, and traditionally, we think of rising rate environment as good for bank margins. However, the rate rises have been so dramatic and the issue is now with forward expectations of cuts being priced in, we're actually seeing an inverted yield curve, which ultimately just means that um, you know, this is why interest rate risk management and, and balance sheet management for banks is so much more important at this at this point. But they have been through these, these cycles before. Um, so it, it, it's not something that should be breaking the financial system. Great, okay. Um, well, what about, you know, also turn to the macro side of things. If, if we've got troubles in the banking sector, what does that mean for inflation? Um, you know, the bogey man of this year, I guess. And, and the real economy, what, what's what's the potential ramifications there, Louis? Well, I think this is very topical. This is getting a, a fair bit of airtime and discussions. I mean, we've come through a period now where all the all the emphasis and uh, views and opinions are around inflation, you know, how long it's gonna stay there, how high it's gonna go, what are the Fed gonna do? And then you have this new, new situation unfolding around a banking crisis. And traditionally, banking crises have tended to be deflationary in nature, so, um, I guess on the on the positive side, you can say that you know with these tightening in credit conditions, which will be an outcome of this uh, banking crisis, it will be doing quite a bit of the heavy lifting for the Fed in terms of um, you know bringing down inflation to to moderate levels, or at least the expectation of that. Um, so that's a that's a positive thing. I guess on the the really downside part of it, um, it could actually also trigger a recession. Um, because it will spill over into, you know, like I said, tighter credit conditions. Um, and we have seen on the back of that, you know, quite substantial bond yield moves, especially in the short end, um, as, as people have re recalibrated those, those sort of risks creeping into the system. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword at the moment, and uh, we'll, we'll have to see how that all plays out. I mean, just, it'll all really depend on the extent to which they can contain what is unfolding in, in terms of the US regional bank situation and, and potential other contagion measures. But as I mentioned, uh, the intervention has been very swift um, and very effective to date, so hopefully it can be contained. Yeah, yeah, great. And I, mean, I think just um, thinking, looking overnight at Chairman Powell's um, comments on the back of the 25 basis point hike, we saw, you know, an admission from him that, um, that you know, a, a reduction in the supply of credit to the US economy through this potential crisis has, you know, the ability to reduce the, um, you know, need for them to, to, to hike like rates to curtail inflation. So, so I guess that's the positive side of the, that double-edged sword. Um, and, and then um, just, um, I mean, with um, regard to, uh, there's a question here about, look, do any beta shares funds hold uh, Credit Suisse hybrids? Um, uh, maybe Lou, you just want to sort of comment on that just to be, be sure we've aired that. Short, short answer is no. No, no hybrids yet, yeah, great. Um, question just um, in regards to, there's a ANZ um, capital notes issue, um, uh, capital notes eight, which is um, getting launched next week. Um, I've also had a couple of questions that have come in with regard to um, you know, specific update with regard to specific holdings within 
um, HBRD and also Beehive, which is our passively managed hybrid fund. Um, I, I'll just I'll hold those questions over just to let you know that we are scheduling a webinar with Chris Joy, who is the, the lead portfolio manager within um, HBRD um, from Coolbar Capital, um, and he's a real authority in, in the um, hybrids market. So we'll have an opportunity to dive deeper um, there next week and, and really sort of discuss some of those issues and, and in fact, some of the new issues um, coming to market there. So I'll hold those over. Um, also another question, and I, I think I touched on this, uh, Louis, I'm not sure if you're happy to share any further comments, but um, what, what, any thoughts on Aussie regionals, Aussie regional banks? Look, so far, uh, nothing has really come to light that, um, you know, is really a cause for concern when it comes to Aussie regionals. So, um, you know, we, we starting, we're staying close to uh, all the information getting, getting shared around, and, and so far nothing has really stood out as something to be concerned about. Great. All right. Well, that, that's reassuring. Um, look, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today on this call. Um, we wanted to keep it short and punchy, and hopefully we managed to address um, all the issues or areas of concern that you have. If you have any other questions, please um, contact us post, and, and we'll endeavour to provide you know, every and all information to assist you. Um, really appreciate, Louis, you joining us here today live on the desk. You're welcome and th thank you everyone for joining. And um, and so as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be doing a, a webinar next Thursday with Chris Joy. Um, so we'll send out an invitation for that as, as follow up. Um, and, and hopefully that provides you know f further light if, if you are interested in diving diving deeper there. But we appreciate your time today. We appreciate your support of BetaShares and have a good day.